Eva and Bruno like to help their parents shop and discover new flavors. Where do all these fruit and vegetables come from? How are they produced when it's so cold out? To find out, we must travel to Southeast Europe in a region that has turned into a vast vegetable garden capable of providing healthy food to 500 million Europeans for nine months of the year, even during winter. But how is it possible that a semi-arid region has become the main supplier of winter fruit and vegetables in Europe? By strengthening the traditional agricultural techniques of the area with technology and continuously incorporating innovations to improve the productivity, quality and sustainability of crops, such as the use of sanding, plastic greenhouse coverings, drip irrigation systems, varieties of seeds adapted to the conditions of the area and organic pest control that make it possible to produce more tons of fruit and vegetables per year. A key part of this agricultural revolution is the solar greenhouse. But what is a solar greenhouse? It's a structure with a translucent cover which captures all the sun's energy while protecting crops from adverse environmental conditions, generating greater productivity with minimal cost and resource consumption. By creating a microclimate, we can grow our fruits and vegetables at any time of the year and in a sustainable way, without resorting to fossil fuels, obtaining a greater quantity of food without sacrificing quality or taste. The miracle of intensive agriculture in this area of Europe is founded on small and family-owned farms, favoring entrepreneurship, share capital, equality and a commitment to protecting natural resources and the environment. The development of partner or cooperative companies is encouraged, as well as the education of workers, 80% of which have some type of official training. Despite the common perception of this part of Europe being a sea of plastic, in reality, the surface area of greenhouses occupies about 30,000 hectares, 3.4% of the total area of land, while almost 50% of this geographical area is protected, which is well above the European average. Techniques such as rainwater harvesting, precision drip irrigation systems or fertigation result in a water footprint that is 20 times lower than in crops that are cultivated in the open air. Additionally, greenhouses have contributed to the reduction of the average annual temperature in the area and each hectare absorbs 10 tons of CO2 per year, which is equivalent to the daily emission of 8 cars. Marketing is carried out by means of cooperatives or agricultural transformation companies improving the farmer's position within the supply chain and their access to funding and technology. The region is a leader in recruiting foreigners into the Spanish workforce, integrating more than 140 nationalities, with agricultural wages that are up to 90% higher than other non-EU countries. Women play an important role as farmers, agricultural technicians and engineers, packers, carriers, line managers, sales representatives and managers, accounting for 71% of all personnel in marketing companies and 30% in farms, a far higher percentage than in other sectors. Only the best varieties that are suited to the tastes of European consumers are grown in solar greenhouses. Food safety and quality are guaranteed through quality certification systems, sustainable production and strict compliance with the high standards of the European Food Safety Agency and of distribution chains. Fresh fruit and vegetables contribute to proper nutrition and provide health benefits as part of a balanced diet. Agriculture in solar greenhouses is one of the most advanced types of cultivation in the world and is the most environmentally friendly form of farming. It has a tracking system that allows you to follow any product from the moment it is planted until it reaches your table. Hello everybody, good morning. Welcome to the second day of Inversola, the Congress, the European Congress, dedicated to uh, showing what uh, greenhouse production in solar greenhouses is. Welcome to this greenhouse, which is located in the province of Almeria, uh, the, the, in the municipality of El Ejido, very near the Mediterranean Sea. 
right next to a, a natural space which is called Puntinas, Puntentinas. And it's a, a, a space of life here where the fruit and vegetables uh, eaten by more than 500 million uh, citizens in Europe are produced. Tomatoes, cucumbers, courgettes, uh, aubergines, fruit and vegetable of the highest quality and uh, above all, a healthy and wholesome food and essential for our diet. And here we are to tell things, uh, interesting things, to uh, finish with those uh, false ideas uh, through, that are spread through ignorance and to learn from our experts. Uh, let's begin with a, a title, Lunar Farmers, the challenge of feeding ourselves beyond Earth. Our first speaker is Naum Mende Chazarra, PhD in geology and a science communicator. And then he's, he also uh, talks about the Mars orbiter, and the idea is to study uh, Martian geology. He's, he wrote the book of uh, a geologist in, de in trouble, and he's talking about science. He works with different uh, media on the Cadena Ser and uh, Rojo Vivo and the Objetivo, the sixth channel. And he also takes part <coughs> in the uh, Lay Orbit uh, program. He's going to talk about uh, the fact that the greenhouse is not just the best option for producing food in, on future space journeys, interplanetary journeys. Now, whenever you're ready, welcome. It's your turn. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this Congress. I tend to go on a bit too much in my talks. What I would like is when we leave here, we start considering the importance of this type of production uh, that, that brings a future, this wonderful part of Almeria and the Mediterranean. Not just that, but, but also we're a species that in the end we're going to travel a lot in the solar system and n nearby places we're going to have to eat. We have to take the food. We won't be able to set up supermarkets with the same ease as here. So if I can get the presentation going now. It seems to be a very extravagant subject. You're going to see that even today we are growing things in space. It sounds a little bit like science fiction, but it's real. Okay, it's fine now. The talk is uh, uh, lunar growers, uh, the challenge of feeding ourselves beyond Earth. We're a species, and our DNA and our culture to explore, to go f further. We've explored all the places in our planet, the most difficult places to find. Uh, we've covered the, plant, the surface of our planet, the deserts, the oceans, and now we're arriving in space. The first time we're coming out of that bubble, that uh, it's a bubble that's protecting us from outer space. It's a very hostile environment for human life. And in fact, in the last 60 years, we've been able to travel to other places as uh, easy as anything to Mars, to the moon. Here you can see a, a photo of a car on the surface of, uh, of the moon. In some years, we can travel there. We can set up lunar bases, not I'm not saying cities, colonies, but a city, the first stages of research. So little by little, we can uh, move our presence from the Earth to other places like the Lune. And in fact, from 2025, it's possible that we may see uh, humans walking on the Moon again, as you can see there. It's a mission of the NASA, a very ambitious mission. 
for the first time after 40 years, we're going to go back to the moon to research, to, to take those first steps, which are now enable us to set up new bases, new ports, which enable us to carry on in human exploration of the solar system. In the last decades, we've uh, experienced a great revolution uh, but uh, they've been all robot missions, no human missions. And with the agriculture that's carried out here, we can take those steps. It's true that uh, almost everything is reduced to, to a problem of logistics. We're talking about space, and we think everything's very close. The Earth, normally we move in the lower orbits where the International Space Station is, uh, that's going around 16 times our planet. It's only 400 kilometers from the surface at the moment. It's not very far away. It's relatively close. But it's much more difficult to get there. It's not that much more difficult to, to get to the moon or to, even to Mars. So for the decade of 2030, 2040, uh, 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 a man trip to Mars. We have to take many things for those human beings are able to survive on the way there and the way back. Really, if we put this all into context, we're very, very far that maybe we need to grow our own food on the way, on our stay there and on the way back. It's going to be very difficult to take all those missions and to resupply them all uh, en route. So, as I was saying before, one of the big problems that the humans have, logistics problems, cost problems, and the difficulty that it is to take a large amount of supplies into space. The first problem, the logistic problem, we're experiencing it very intensely in the last months. This news of the país a few months ago, the economy uh, is going to fall again for the confinements and the breaking of the chain, the supply chain. The people who supply us, that provide us with tools and valuable uh, uh, objects, well, there have been problems, it's slowed down. And of course these trips we've seen, there can be a great lack of other things that can affect us differently. For example, energy, we're talking about gas that enables us to produce electrical energy. Imagine that we go to the moon or Mars and all of a sudden the supply chain is broken for a number of months. If we're not able to take food to Mars, then we will die of hunger. So we have to start growing there not just take the food from the Earth, uh, other resources as well. And of course, how much does it cost to take a kilo of tomatoes to Mars? Well, one kilo of tomatoes is going to cost, with the cheapest technology we have at the moment, it's about 3,000 euros. Well, imagine we have to take many kilos of tomatoes, lettuces, water, wouldn't it be easier if we were able to grow from seed all that food during the during the journey and during our stay there and to be able to save us all that money? We don't have to just take food, clothes, machinery, technology, and the basis where we're going to stay in the future. It's going to consume a great uh, amount of uh, resources. And of course, we have the difficulty of transport. Nowadays, the most ambitious niche mission to take a load to space, as you can see, it's only able to take 150 tons into space, and that uh, ship still hasn't flown into space. So we're not going to be able to see its real uh, load capacity. So that's one of the logistical problems that we saw at the beginning. We've also got a, another problem of mass sending it, uh, as well as the cost. It's not like a lorry that we can take along the road and supply a shopping center. It's a, a much faster chain. It's a lot of distance to get to the moon. In a few years, we can get to the, in a few hours we can get to the space station. The moon, not much longer, but 
Um, so Mars is even further away, so we need to be able to produce that food. When we're talking about a term, it's independence. So when, we, uh, when we're established in those areas, not necessarily to live, but to carry on researching, to continue exploring the solar system, and to know more about the planets, to advance in our knowledge, and quite often that's very important. We're going to need some independence. Not all the resources are going to be exportable from the Earth to Mars, uh, to the Moon. They're going to have to be produced there. Uh, so uh, if we've got a problem with the supply chain, we can fix it there. Things like food that has to be uh, produced there, it's going to make it easier for uh, Martian and lunar bases to operate. And what's all that got to do with Almeria and with greenhouses? Well, it, one thing is fundamental. The solar system is a hostile environment. You see this picture of Mars taken a few weeks ago. It's barren like the moon. Uh, it's got a little bit of an atmosphere. That's possibly the only difference. Maybe we have to consider a good place to set up an atmosphere where we can be protected is in the inside of the greenhouses, which are going to feed those astronauts, and to be able to avoid that hostility of the environment there. Here we have this picture taken from the uh, International Space Station, and very nice of this part of Almeria, of El Ejido. These greenhouses, the function that they can have in on the Moon and on Mars is to create an atmosphere which enables the plants to grow, and at the same time it enables the gases that the plants uh, produce and exchange with the atmosphere. It can help, help us regulate uh, the atmosphere we are in so they need optimum conditions to be grown. <coughs> all that technology, all that uh, knowledge of how to regulate it in this laboratory that we have here in Almeria to take into space will be absolutely fundamental to be able to continue advancing in, the, uh, in space exploration. Of course, again, we live very well in, in, on Earth. Our atmosphere is a little bit like a, a greenhouse. It protects us from the hostility of outer space. Um, we, we will precisely have to build that in other areas like Mars or the Moon. It's very important. In Mars, we have the advantage that we have cycles similar to the day and the night that we have on Earth. In the Moon, it will be a little bit more difficult. But we can also experiment uh, illumination, the lighting we have to take there. Uh, daylight, night, night time, so we can see how it affects the growth of the plants and how we can improve that technology uh, here that we have to export there. It's true that we are able nowadays to create an atmosphere where we're able to create oxygen from carbon dioxide uh, in the um, in the Martian atmosphere. This machine here, it's called Moxie, it's worked there. If we could use that technology, the knowledge that we've uh, learned in the greenhouses to be able to generate artificial atmospheres that we're going to need not just for the plants but also for the astronauts to be able to uh, survive on the basis just using those plants and we can uh, carry out a, a feedback uh, how we consume CO2, how we produce the oxygen on uh, inside those bases. It will be a very interesting point. Also, the techniques of re water reuse that are being used here and now, they can, be, they can help us in the future as well to see how we can reuse the water in those bases, how we can recycle them. Uh, they're doing them in the International Space Station. They can do it from their own urine. We can use that uh, technology, uh, which uh, the technology are used in the greenhouses, the reuse technology. We can also reuse it, not just for the crops, but also for the humans. But it's also very important to, to test it here, and it is being tested here. Also, nowadays, we're attempting to get crops uh, to grow in the soil, the substrate of the, of the moon or or Mars. It's a very arid area. It can be used to, to turn it into a hospitable terrain for plants. We also have to use hydroponic crops, which can also be used here, uh, which we've been testing for many decades and, and will be really necessary in space. That technology is tested here. 
and there it's uh, being subjected to many tests which guarantees that it can be used in space. In fact, here there's a very recent uh, article that shows how we are able to grow already um, seeds, earth seeds in uh, Martian soil. Uh, it's, uh, they're going to have many, many problems. We're seeing how we can transform this uh, relatively simply uh, to enable it to be used for uh, growing. And in fact, in the space station, they're, they're growing absolutely normally. These product, products are not produced there. This was taken a couple of weeks ago. And we saw the first space peppers completely grown in the International Space Station. We don't, they don't consume them there is what they do, is seeing how the microgravity affects them, uh, how the microgravity affects the crops. Uh, before, they, before they can eat them there, they have to come back to Earth to be tested and to see if, how they're growing and they require other elements. But here is, a, here is the proof that it can be done. We can grow in space. And this technology that can be used in the International Space Station, it's a very difficult place for plants to grow. There is no gravity like in, uh, on Earth. Uh, it allows the roots to grow down, the, the stems to grow up. And we see that it's something that's very viable nowadays. Now they're sort of uh, working out how those future greenhouses are going to be on the surface of the moon or Mars. They're going to be small to start with uh, because we've got a great technological capacity to set up this great system of greenhouses. It reminds us, these uh, greenhouses remind us very much of this, uh, the greenhouses we have here. One of the things we're going to be facing there when we travel to space is to be able to produce intensively. We're not going to have great areas where we're going to be able to produce. We have to grow those uh, products and we have to take advantage of all that knowledge that we've got to in the future, in the future to carry on advancing. And now to finish with, uh, just a, an idea. It's true that many times we we look down on the sea of plastic. It is the future, the, the future of having uh, environmentally friendly agriculture, future, vanguard. Uh, we're seeing how all that technology that we're using here, researching and innovating here, is going to help us to be able to feed us in the future, not only on our planet, but also outside our frontiers. Thank you very much. Don't don't go away. Don't go away. Some questions. No, we can't we can't eat the space peppers, can we? But uh, now we can hear. Now let's. Recently. Uh, yeah. I was listening to Naum, listening to, considering how we are in here in Almeri. Uh, there are people thinking, asking you a question. When, where can they buy a, a cup, pile of hectares on the moon to be able to set up a greenhouse? It's a very interesting question because uh, it's not. It's a controversial question. In the last 20, 30 years, there, we've had places in space. Uh, there is a treaty on outer space that uh, was signed in the 1960s and the outer space is relatively protected in the sense that we can only go there for peace missions, research, but we're going to see what's going to happen in the next years. There are countries which are uh, trying to add legislation to that to be able to take advantage of uh, resources in outer space. Uh, maybe a sort of a gold rush there to see who the first people are going to get it. It's a very interesting question and it's very open still. Well, we'll see in the next Congress, maybe we will have an answer. Lola Gomez wanted to ask you a question. Let's get the microphone so she can ask you. Hello to everybody. 
more than 2,500 people following this Congress. Lola, whenever you're ready, I'd like to ask something that I'm very interested in. One of the large advances in agriculture is uh, m m raising the height of the greenhouses for tomatoes. Okay, the tomatoes go up, around and down. And so that's quite stressful for the plant when they're going down because the plant gravity is going down, but the plant's always going up looking for the light. Our idea is, uh, is, that, is that possible to maintain that? That's why we hang the tomato plants. What would happen to that tomato plant in, in, a, sp in a space without gravity? Uh, we don't know yet. It's true that microgravity in the in International Space Station, the plants grow slightly differently, but we still have to see how that growth will be, um, because they're going to be they're going to weigh less. <coughs> the problem will be when we try and bring them down. We'll see how that change in gravity is going to make them grow differently, to make them more bushy. We we still don't know that. That's why it's that's why we're researching in space because we need to know how the plants behave in that, in case of that uh, different uh, effect, that movement through their, their sap system. This is what's being researched now, how that's going to work in space, because we don't have an answer for that yet. I'm thinking now. Uh, now another one. Cult <laughs> crops. Without gravity, the, the International Space Station is always doing it, already doing it. Any other questions? Finish there. Another question from Victor. We're here to listen to everybody. Hello, I arrived late. If I don't ask, I'll blow up. We always do many things uh, to to spread the knowledge that is grown in Almeria regarding greenhouses which is exported all over the world. People study greenhouses and they're exported to other places. In Mexico, South America, Africa to the moon and they're exported to other places. In Mexico, South America, Africa to the moon. We test new seeds, uh, new products for the plant. It's only done in butter. We're going to use it in olive oil to start with and then we're going to finish off with butter and we're going to put it in the end and uh, just the last the final touch meantime we're going to beat three eggs so with the residual heat of the frying pan I'm going to take it off now put some pepper on there, I like quite a lot of pepper and a little bit of salt. There are two ways to do this, there are people who put it straight in here and mix it all up and other people who take everything, keep everything out. So we're all gonna, we're gonna mix it all up and heat up the, uh, the frying pan again. In the longer version, we start here in sort of scrambled eggs. I like to sort of uh, get it here. It's very important to have a non-stick uh, frying pan. And so you can see we're getting a little bit of volume here. And we move the liquid around to get that film there. If you see that it's a little bit too hot, take it off. And with the residual heat, it'll carry on the heating. And now we're going to roll it over. And it's very useful to have a spatula, a spoon-shaped spatula, but you can do, do it with a, a wooden one as well. And if we want it to set a little bit more, we can leave it there a little bit more. That's what it should look like. It's getting a little bit uh, taller, as you can see. And what we do is put a little bit of butter on the top. With the heat, it will melt. 
and it'll make it shine and have a really nice taste just like in France and in the end to finish off while it's melting we cut a, a few shallots and we put it on top when we try this we're going to try it right away we're going to see how the inside is much juicier and when we taste it we're going to really notice it what we should notice are the scrambled eggs and that's how that's how we we do a real omelette nice and juicy <coughs> and it melts in our mouth hey it has a it's a really nice thing to cook in our in our greenhouses this chef has a really good time good breakfast with fruit and vegetables. Now we're going to start with the next uh, presentation. Um, climate change, neither indifference nor apocalypse. Jesus Zamora is a doctor of philosophy and economics. Uh, and in the, uh, the, uh, ed the Open University, he's published many books and also philosophical works and the book and Plato's Cave and the 40 Robbers and um, Gift of the Kings and Counter Apocalypsis against the idea that our civilization is condemned to disappear very soon. We're going to Zamora Bonilla. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you in the greenhouse. It's Thank you very much for the invitation here. Thank you for everybody who's here, who's seeing us on streaming. The main problem I have, as you said in the presentation, I'm a philosopher, dedicated to philosophy. It's very abstract, and I know absolutely nothing about this. So I have the feeling that I've come here more to learn than to teach anything. So we basically re reflect more than teach to offer some certain reflections. As I said, fascinating this information that uh, Lola was giving us on how greenhouses work, of which I knew very little. And of course, this, that subject, I can't illustrate you more than uh, you already know. You sure know much more than I do. What I'd like to talk about mainly is an idea that uh, in the recent decades, recent years, an idea which is floating in the air that we're finishing off our ecosystem, our civilization, uh, the biosphere, and everything is going to come to an end, humanity, and uh, the idea is to, to try to you know reduce the the fear uh, um, surrounding that problem. See if this works. This is the book, which is going around there. This is the main reason why I've been invited here to 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 you know make people less apocalypse. Uh, talks about many things, not just the fear of climate change, but also all the reasons, uh, the ideological reasons, in the meaning that they are ideas more than that they depend on ide ideology. And no conspiracy theory here. The ideas that are floating around our, our heads and in the atmosphere. <coughs> How bad humanity is. The main message of the book is that obsession with the apocalypse that we've been experiencing in the last years is not only because of the real fear of certain damage that we're uh, inflicting but also conf uh, conviction of humanity that that uh, human beings deserve apocalypse because we're so bad and so harmful for ourselves and for the rest of the species that it would be good for a a plague or a catastrophe to finish us off uh, on the earth and the, the earth would come back to its natural state. The message that I'm interpreting with the book here was quite the opposite. The human can survive. 
not only for many years, many more millennia, tens, hundreds of millennia, thousands, millions of years, thanks to technology. But anyway, as I was saying, through books, recent books, about the one on the right came out at the same time with mine. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't use it for ins inspiration. I inspired myself in the first one, possibly, which is the main example of the message, the, the apocalyptic message. We are turning the earth into an inhospitable place, inhabitable, uninhabitable. The uninhabitable earth, as the book says. And, and the other book, which came out uh, more or less at the same time as mine, what it's attempting to do, with more data than mine, because I'm a philosopher, I'm not a scientist, I talk more about ideas than, than facts. This book does provide more data uh, as to why this fear of the apocalypse is uh, unfounded. But also, uh, uh, anyway, the reason why I was a little bit obsessed with the apocalypse comes from different, uh, a different idea of mine, which is my literary line. Novels I had written were these. These are post-apocalypsis uh, novels. You imagine the apocalypse uh, artistically, photographically sells a lot more and a lot more. So the first one is a novel, more typical. Um, what's going to happen after? What are the, what's the historic roots of that catastrophe? I'm not going to talk much about it. And the second, I'm very happy to hear that if I'd known. I, I would have centered all my talk on this topic. Uh, it's a novel about a novel, a human colony uh, in a very distant planet in a system outside our galaxy and in many years' time, of course, isolated and has to survive into the future without the possibility of receiving any supplies from the other colonies. They don't have a problem, there's no atmosphere. They're on a planet which is similar to the Earth with its own plants, its own animals. The problem is the biochemistry is completely different to our biochemistry. And therefore, the humans who live on that planet can't eat the plants or the animals that uh, grow naturally there. And the planet is called um, uh, Mundo. 80 world for reasons that are explained. One of the interesting things, the, the interesting thing is the animals there can't can't for the humans, which is right. They have to eat something. So what they eat are plants which they brought from the earth. But this is in many years' time. These are that they've developed specifically themselves. But when they are isolated and can't receive supplies, they have to fertilize something. And they talked a little bit about the urine before. The Martian, the film The Martian, they have to fertilize the potatoes. Well, in space it's the same. This, this colony has become isolated it's lost the technology science civilization finally what they discover to be able to to keep this crop going is that the fertilizer that they use for them they're called palma like any other, well, you can think of possibly palm trees, but no, no, anyway, they're called palmas. The fertilizer is turned into something sacred. They based on the fertilizer, the most important thing in the world is a natural biological uh, fertilizer for the plant. So it's a, um, a novel, religious taboos 
that we know in our civilization, in our culture, are, are transferred to that fertilizer in particular. I'm not going to tell you any more about it and spoil it for you. <coughs> On to the topic. <laughs> the column there is uh, causing some problems. And the problem with mm, climate change, as I said, is, is a real problem. And it's going to cause many, and is causing many problems in some parts of the world more, others fewer. In Spain, for example, very probable that. Uh, that uh, will the climate will now, and uh, not only climate change, but it's also possible that the substances that we need for are going to become scarce, and then science to intervene here to solve the problems. But what I'm a attempting to argue in the first part of the book, this is not necessarily going to lead to the end of civilization. Uh, there are going to be problems, effectively, but not problems that cause uh, a scenario similar to the novels I've mentioned, or films uh, like Mad Max or Waterworld. Going to compare in the end, to see what, what the uh, level of problems that can be caused. Why? This isn't a mere opinion that I think it, it's not going to be so serious. Uh, the uh, scientific uh, reports about climate change, when they're talking about the type of problems that could be caused, that could cause a, co a collapse of civilization from a uh, um, uh, the, the channel, the, the previous one, phenomena, the turning points that uh, could lead to a, a real collapse of the climate system and the ecosystems, therefore, the classifying as l not very probable. They can happen. But, but could, and the probability is only a little more relevant in, in the missions, uh, much, much more uh, extreme uh, of uh, emissions. And so we're, we're not arriving at that point. The report that came out this year, the scenario is much more similar. There have not been great changes. We can't see this very well. This ideology that's floating around uh, a little bit uh, like last year, a little bit like now, um, as I'm a philosopher, I can carry on talking. A little like, like now, I'm not quite sure when I when I run out. Of time, I'm running out of time, so I can start finishing. That's going around is a concept which is key, which is uh, embedded in our minds, is a concept of the Anthropocene. Is the geological uh, evolution, not only biological, of the history of Earth has arrived at a, a point which it is influenced by human activity, which is obvious. The geologist thousands of years very mind phenomena in the geological register which will have no other explanation apart from human activity simply not necessary to look for anything strange in technology Europe for example is practically deforested com compared to what it was like a few thousand years ago and this naturally will leave uh, traces and register the, the erosion type of soils created uh, on a forest in a forest are, are different the question is what I found fascinating about the Anthropocene more than the, uh, 
the fusion it's had is the fact that there's been a sort of a fever for the, the, the thing that the Anthropocene is negative and we're putting all the blame on all the human beings. It's all the human beings are guilty. We have to define more precisely the people who are really to blame for <coughs> Here we have the alternatives to uh, Anthropocene, <laughs> the Anglican, the, the gringos are the baddies, Capitolocene, the, the evil, evil is, the, is capitalism, um, uh, Homocene, about men, uh, Metropocene, the Petroleocene, Tanatoceno, uh, Tanatocene, Thermocene. And the one that I find most fascinating, Tulthocene, uh, the myths of Tulhu, is the most monstrous of all. To, to center. Uh, myself and to get into the core of the matter and we can't see that very well on the screen this is a report which has been produced this year that I mentioned in the presentation I work in philosophy in economy this is something that philosophers um, crazy about philosophers don't like the economy they consider it to be the, the demoni <laughs> the, 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 the devil and economists don't like philosophy. They consider us the same way. <coughs> this is a report of, of economic of climate change um, carried out by the uh, Swiss. It's a private institute, and that's what Swiss do. They've got all the the, the industry and the purple cows and finance. So that what they do is they take lots of money from lots of people, invest it, and to get profit. And so what they're most, or the Swiss are most worried about, is what's going to happen with the profitability of the possible investments. So this basically depends on how much the different countries around are going to increase their GDP, how the change will affect growth or uh, of uh, GDP. Uh, Globally, here there are scenarios depending on the increase in temperatures uh, expected in the coming decades. I'm not quite sure until mid 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 century, end of century. The most favourable scenarios would be a reduction of CO2 emissions. The most drastic, possibly, would be an increase of 1.5 degrees. In the extremes, we'd be talking about an increase of three or more degrees. An increase of three degrees or more is quite serious and can cause mm, many problems. Those the bars here, the bar, they indicate uh, that a rise in temperature there would uh, reduce the growth of GDP. On the left, when the temperature doesn't go up too much, the, the reduction in GDP is not much. Uh, 15, 20 percent would, wouldn't get to 10 percent. There are three in each case because the column on the left of each three is what they've measured. The econometric techniques that they've had and they've multiplied it by 5 and 10 as the engineers carry out stress tests. Well, let's consider it's much worse. Now the column on the right is the left multiplied by 10. Let's consider that things are going really, really badly. As you can see in the worst possible scenario, the one at the right doesn't even get to 20%. Uh, the reduction of the GDP doesn't go to 20% really strange, but in the book I've seen some previous uh, uh, reports, some of them even arrived at 
considered the possible uh, reduction of 30% of the GDP. That is a revolution. If the if we, uh, all earn 30% less, there will be a, an enormous reduction. This is the same in a different type of graph. <laughs> this is a decomposition of the of the why GDP would be reduced, uh, different factors involved, different types of climate events. Some could be from drought, some from floods. As you can't see it very, very each uh, um, horizontal uh, row is a country. And the ones that suffer the most are in Asia, India, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. Would, uh, it would their GDP would uh, diminish even more. Consider this doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go. The P, the GDP is going to go down. Uh, um, it, it, what's going to be reduced is the growth of the GDP. Let's move back 100 years to 1920, more or less. And we think, what was the GDP um, of a place 100 years ago? It was approximately eight, ten times less than now. Not talking about pesetas, but talking about uh, purchasing power. <coughs> the purchasing power of the Spaniards, an average Spaniard in the last hundred years multiplied between eight and ten times in one century. The, the purchasing power of an actual current Spaniard is equal. And it's very different. About different goods were consumed before, but it's different to now. But approximately the person uh, in 1920 whose income, average income, and then multiplied by 10. So a person would be considered quite rich. The average Spaniard was that of the very rich Spaniards 100 years ago. So with a, a growth rate, an economic growth rate, similar to the one we've had in the last years, but uh, prolonged to the end of the 21st century, to the 2,100 to 2,120, the level of prosperity of the inhabitants of the inhabitants in, in 100 years, 80 years, will approximately be the same, 8 to 10 times greater than the current. So if we to keep this uh, economic growth, our great grandchildren or great great children to live on average and have a power which is going to be eight to ten times greater than ours, which for us is almost impossible to imagine, which is for the 1920, seeing the, our standard of living now, it's possible. But in the developed world, the near level of growth will be different, so we'll have different production problems. But there are many, many thousands and millions of people who can very easily multiply their standard of living to 10. Now, let's apply that figure to the, to the figure in within 80 years, people eight. Uh, times better than now, they're going to have times the income uh, they have now. And let's apply that to the uh, figure we've seen in the reduction of the growth of GDP, which is the, per the worst of all the scenarios we've seen. If we take 30% off 8, yeah, around 5 or 6, the climate change, <coughs> the consequences will be that our great-grandchildren will only be five times richer than us. Oh, it's, oh, it's very sad for our descendants, poor things. 
they're not going to if they're not badly uh, being five times richer than we are now. And I'll start now. It's true. There are problems, but it's also true. A lot more money, a lot more um, face those problems than, than we have now. This is, to finish with, a comparison with the idea of the magnitude of the problem. It's an enormous problem. There's many costs and, and many sad, uh, a flood, for example. It's a catastrophe. It causes many, many problems. A reduction of in wealth uh, is what can be caused by such a familiar concept as uh, corruption. Uh, it, re it produces a reduction of, in the growth in a similar rate for the worst scenarios for climate change. This means that climate change isn't a problem? No, it's a problem. Uh, a similar magnitude of corruption, which is also a very big problem. It's not a problem that's going to lead to the collapse of civilization because possibly the civilization, the collapse we talk about uh, death for by drug addiction about eight million people die due to uh, tobacco three million alcohol one million other drugs about 12 million people from now to the end of the uh, century we're going to be talking about 1,000 million victims towards the end of the century. How many victims can, in the worst scenarios that we're considering, uh, can climate change cause? They're not going to be that many. The worst of the cases, naturally everything collapses and not only the uh, humans die, all the insects as well. We're, we're not going to get to such a tragic situation. Uh, the, the, the scenarios which are m most expected. Uh, we're not going to get to a thousand million uh, casualties. It's a problem, but not a plague, not a problem like the plagues. Uh, and I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much indeed. This was thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I don't I have one. What point are you in? Are you between the optimists and the, the pessimists? What point are you in? I'm in between. The last book talks about a very long-term future of humanity and the friends that I have most technical, lo te technical loving they, uh, they, they've considered that uh, it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a going to live uh, many, many more years, but not very different to the way we live now. We're not going to be fusing our computers with brain, uh, and with our brains. We're going to a little bit better than now, but not much better. <coughs> Another question. Human beings are the way we are, and knowing how we are, we've arrived to this point being the way we are. See if we smooth this all out a little bit. Um, is don't we consider this? Aren't we going to just sort of sit back and, and and not worry? Well, trying to increase. Uh, maybe that is the only virtue of the elliptic messages. Humans need a sort of shock treatment to realise what. The is. And so as I've tried to say, well, it's not that serious possibly better that people do get a little bit frightened. Uh, what am I going to do? <laughs> I don't like seeing things different to the way they are. Thank you for your point of view. Thank you for coming to Almeria in this uh, Inversola Congress.
we're going to uh, open up to another video so you can find out what life is like in the greenhouses. Um, it all has a very important social... The area of solar greenhouses in southern Europe is known for its arid terrain and it was sparsely populated until 60 years ago when the largest and most productive agricultural project in history was launched. Solar greenhouses. They managed to turn the desert into a vast vegetable garden. And thanks to the 14,000 families of farmers, we generate more than 45,000 direct jobs and 100,000 indirect jobs in the region. 60% are held by immigrant workers from more than 140 different countries. They are people who've spent years working together with farmers and their families, learning the trade and the language, and even undertaking new business ventures. Southern Europe is a leader in incorporating immigrants into the working world, making the area an area of integration and coexistence. If you want to find out more, follow the sun. Are from Europe and we're sustainable. Thousands, thousands of workers around this production model, which uh, produces fresh fruit and vegetables all year round, especially in the coldest months for the rest. Europe. Now we're going to talk to our next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Sapiens Tomato. It's, uh, it's a food science communicator and she works in the Munich Foundation as a researcher. <coughs> The uh, sapiens of tomatoes. She dedicated economic communication and amongst the most consumed in the world, potatoes, onions, and amongst all these is a tomato. It's, uh, is, it creates the most passion, so many, so many different shapes and sizes and colors. And tomatoes were absolutely in, inedible, even and how did we manage to turn this into an essential part of our diet which we enjoy eating and tasting. <clears throat> Maria Nicolas, please come on in, it's your turn, welcome. Thank you very much. Those of you, those of you here, well, many of you are asking or will have asked yourself what this talk is about. This uh, title isn't very explicative. Here you see this uh, Tomato Sapiens. It's a book which talks about tomatoes, but it's not a tomato book. It's a book to think. This book that uh, was uh, set up with uh, Fernanda Arria with a team of uh, researchers, and it's part of Wikipedia, and it is the most uh, extensive uh, work in Spanish in Wikipedia. And now we're going to know what it's uh, tomatoes about. What is Sapiens? It's a methodology of research which connects knowledge to understand from a, a point of view uh, which is both holistic and systemic. It's necessary to understand to be able to create a methodology. The Sapiens can be applied to many objects of study from companies, uh, coffee, uh, in Wikipedia, or products that are produced in this book, uh, the Sapiens Tomato, it can be applied to uh, produce products. <coughs> so when we started to do this book, the objective was to understand the role of tomatoes in uh, restoration, uh, gastronomy, and we have to have had to channel it from many different points of view. If we ask ourselves, what is a tomato? If I ask that question, the answer that I would reach, achieve, it's a vegetable, it's a fruit, uh, or 
uh, and it's true, accepting some subtleties, none of you would be wrong. So if we were to ask uh, what is a tomato to professionals who study it day by day, uh, work day by day, uh, hauliers, botanists, all the answers would be said. In the end, uh, the tomato is many things. It can be a color, it can be a film, the uh, tomato soup. It depends on the, the discipline uh, we analyze it from. And what we do have data on, and we can after the potato, tomato is the most produced vegetable in the world, and 180 million tons uh, and from China is leading, and Spain is in the eighth place. Production of three percent of that 80 million tons. <coughs> And of that percentage, 80% of that is produced here in Andalusia, mainly for fresh consumption and in Extremadura for processed plants. A lot of this production is exported. It's true that it's a very desired fruit. So 600 million kilos of tomato per year. Curious <coughs> because that hasn't always been like that. Plant on earth for longer than us and for, uh, for any uh, organism it, it started around about the earth was formed around 4,500 years a million years ago plants then animals and about 8 years ago the first species of tomatoes appeared it wasn't until 5 million years later that uh, uh, hominids arrived as we're seeing here in this slide, the first species of tomatoes didn't look anything like as we we're looking at today. They had very small fruits. They were um, <coughs> covered in fur, uh, different shapes and sizes, and the majority were very acid and toxic. And we said that the human being has changed tomatoes completely, domesticated it in Mesoamerica. And we're not how it happened, but the human being, by domesticating, domesticating tomatoes, made tomatoes uh, more comestible. They reduced the selenium, we increased the size, we improved the flavor. And you can see from the photo on the left and the photo on the right, it wasn't two days. This change didn't happen from one day to the next. A lot of stages of domestication in between. And one of those phases, the Spaniards discovered the new world and the tomato. <coughs> in the chronicles of India, of the Indias, when they arrived at uh, America, they saw that there were, there were uh, tomatoes in the capital and it was a fruit which was completely integrated in their diet and the American uh, culture and they told us that they made uh, sauce and salt so and, and that uh, once it arrived in Europe it wasn't uh, used uh, as a So in the 17th century, a gardener says that in one of the first books that were on gardening, written, he situated it in chapters for ornamental. So it was just uh, 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 used. Book, where there were different plant species. You put the, uh, the 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 tomato plant right next to a, a hallucinogenic uh, and toxic. The mandragora was considered uh, the love apple with the aphrodisiac quality it had. And curiously, the French and the English, the first years, the first contact with the tomato, they called it as they called it, uh, as the mandragora, as the pomme d'amour, or love apple. 
so they uh, didn't quite like the yellow. Uh, the Italians called it the mm, the golden apple because of its yellow color, and uh, the Spaniards used uh, of a girl called and we called it tomato. tomato. In any case, and the the cooks were not too interested in in cooking tomatoes. They didn't first years due mainly to the close relationship he had with Mandragora, but also because the, the tomato was in the early stages of domestication. It was a, a sort of a wild plant. Wild plants were not considered very uh, healthy, and obviously there were no vegetables in that time. And that was like that until the end of the 17th century. It seems that the uh, kitchen to, or the first cuisine was the Spaniard to use tomatoes successfully. The Scalco la Modena was Antonio Ladi, an Italian, and that described a recipe which was uh, so, um, tomato sauce, Spanish style. So they've written other books, so we understand that that knowledge was imported from Spain to the Italians. And then years went by, and tomato reached other air, culinary areas of Europe, and they started appearing in other, in other books, talking about different tomatoes sauces and stuffed tomatoes. <clears throat> Here I wanted to talk about two curiosities that we found it when we were writing the book. And although nowadays the tomatoes are mainly used to accompany uh, pasta. As we've seen, one of the first uses was not to accompany pasta, but to accompany fish. And that's the way it was for a hundred years. Uh, common today, but then it wasn't. So if we have to talk about preparation of tomato in Andalusia, what we chilled vegetable soup, tomato soup, and one of the recipes that we found of the gazpacho, it doesn't have tomatoes in it. It's got anchovies, bread, and everything else, but no tomatoes. Uh, Eighty years had to go by that we before we found a gazpacho with with uh, tomatoes, and it happened on the other side of the Atlantic. An American cook decided to put uh, tomatoes in the gas and, and something that's so typically Spanish wasn't produced, wasn't invented in Spain. Seen over the years, uh, tomato has production has we've increased its resistance to pests and improved its taste, but it. It seems that today there's a certain reticence to everything, chemical things coming from biotechnology and the sort of nature. We look when we go to the supermarket for natural products. What is a natural tomato? Is it a, a, an organic tomato from my village? Is it natural? Many people think it is, but the reality is that natural tomato is what spontaneously in nature. <clears throat> the one we've seen before, which was acid, toxic, very with uh, uh, hair. And if we knew that, we would not be looking for a natural tomato. We, when we went to the supermarket, we would appreciate all the work that's gone into producing that, and the breeding, growing practices. We'd look for that Another classic, and classic question is, is our tomatoes healthy? The answer is it depends. Depends on the person, the pathology, the state of your health. What is it? And we can state is nutritionally, tomato is 94% water, and its uh, main uh, composition is uh, carbohydrates. Its chemistry varies according Different, differ according to the mm, ripening and the way it's and the cultivar that's used. Re, thanks to research, uh, we can see what we were talking about. Mm, so the 
tomatoes have more lycopene, which is uh, more than before, and minus solenoid, which is the alkaloid, which was uh, present before. So in this research, we've seen that we can improve the antioxidant uh, characteristic of a tomato. We can add uh, virgin olive oil or um, avocado. It's a uh, biosoluble uh, lycopene, so uh, absorb it much more easily. Uh, what is true, if you write that we've got gas salad with just enjoy them thinking about whether it's more nutritional flavor or not or more carbohydrates or not where we want that salad that tomato salad to be great flavor that our friends remember it like the best in the salad they've ever had so may the tomato may to, to feed us, it can be as gastronomical as any like uh, truffles or caviar. The difference in between tasting and, and feeding ourselves is the intention which we have for producing that salad. So if we produce a, a tomato salad with olive oil, looking for excellent, so our friends enjoy it uh, to the maximum, uh, a tomato that can enable us to enjoy a, an experience where well, we do enjoy that type of experience is in uh, restaurants in gastronomic restaurants in the kitchen they take a product that could be tomato technique that could be cutting and a, and a tool it could be a knife there are different techniques and many different tools and you can multiply it. These factors produce many results, thousands of uh, ideas. Others are interesting, others not, others better, others worse. But it uh, leads to many, many different uh, creations, uh, like the ones we can see on the screen at the moment. Um, the textures from the Bulli restaurant, um, tomato and cavioli from Rabikina. Um, to enjoy with olive oil <coughs> and from the uh, restaurant Kiki da Costa a slice of tomato, dried tomato with vinegar rice, uh, more than 50 different ways to produce it uh, some like this and others that are created expressly for the book and finally what they have in common, what all these uh, uh, productions have in, co in common, there's a great knowledge of the, all the possibilities of the product as, uh, as is to happen the uh, startup Minix Seafood. Uh, it's a variety that's grown in Almeria, and they've chosen a plant-based uh, tuna uh, substitute. It's a vegetable uh, substitute for um, raw uh, raw tuna. It could be more environmentally sustainable um, for. Uh, for example, uh, replacing sushi or ceviche, for example. And this and tuna is, is a place uh, affected by, over, by overfishing, so it, it could be possible in the future that we will not be able to eat the sushi that we eat today. And I saw it as a very interesting alternative. And finally, these ideas, all of them that we've seen, all the creations of the tomatoes, uh, come from thinking without fear and during the time we've been producing the book we've <clears throat> had many ideas maybe we could use the tomato seeds to create something with different textures or with water or we could distill the fragrance of tomato leaves which are very aromatic to give uh, to, to flavor other creations we could uh, uh, dehydrate the skin to, to produce some chips. These uh, uh, ideas are for gastronomy. We can concentrate on uh, different ways of producing tomatoes or new cultivars. It all depends on the, cult the perspective that, that it's given. Tomatoes are for that, to make us
questions to think. In the end, understanding tomato is the base to be able to create and innovate, innovate with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mireya. Very, very interesting. Have some tomatoes. Thank you very much. That's a, a pear tomato. If you notice, that could easily be the tomato. The good idea is looks like a light bulb, a yellow light bulb. Yeah. Let's taste it. Delicious. Absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. Very tasty and good. Okay. Now, Mireya. I'm going to hold this enormous tomato, recently picked right next door. It's, uh, it needs a bit more color. It's a uh, groovy tomato, ro uh, pink. Yeah, good question. No. As I explained at the beginning, tomatoes took a long time to become part of our culture. Part of our it's done it. It's the main ingredient of many, many creations. We do typical base for stews, for any sort of... No, 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 we, we wouldn't be able to do away with tomatoes. It's what I mentioned. It's one of the most widely grown vegetables today because it's a very sought-after fruit. And no, I, this is chefs look for in a tomato. <coughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated, complicated question coming from a journalist. What chefs are looking for is to be able to surprise the uh, the people going to their restaurant, looking for, so for the creation they have in mind, so it can give good results for the creation they want to to prepare the best for tomatoes, best for gazpacho, best for spreading. And in the end, one of the things I mentioned, are there things to produce new cultivars? Well, yes, we can uh, create tomatoes precisely for the, the, the creation. So that's one of the issues we've got. The possibilities are almost infinite. Any questions? Jose Antonio is questions. Hi, Mireya. It was nice to meet you yesterday in the first uh, day. We were uh, some of those tomatoes here with with Lola. The one you've got looks like a light bulb. You mentioned yesterday you took the Sapiens tomato, six months in Fito seeds, another six months with Adria. The question I'm going to ask you, before that year, how you understood the tomato then? And how you understand it uh, now? What's what's the what's surprised you of that immersion in the world of tomatoes? Good question. The truth is, before going to Bouilly and Fito, tomatoes uh, for me were just like anybody uh, people who's n not a specialist in it. It was an ingredient. It was a product used, which. I Every day I use it to make many different dishes, but it wasn't. It was a good alternative to meat and fish. And vegetarian, vegan was coming up. So in that, from that perspective, I like tomatoes very, very much. Who doesn't? I love tomatoes. It, it, for me, it was you know in a. In a took quite a place in my pantry. My perspective has changed and what I was most surprised about is the fact that we could see from, it depends on the perspective, it can be one thing or another. And in the end, historically speaking, uh, it's had a, a trajectory and it's changed quite incredibly how humans have demanded tomatoes. It, uh, like before and after, quite, quite radical in the history of tomatoes. That that really caught my attention. The importance for the growers in our 
food every day. Without, without growers, there would be no tomatoes. No farmers, no tomatoes. One of the things we mentioned in about the, the dish, this um, education is necessary. People know where those come from. And a, and a great effort from, from many professionals until it reaches our table. Now, Lola. I'd like to ask you so everybody can hear it. I've been working on uh, diffusion for, for agriculture for many years. I've been in the world of gastronomy for a while as well. The great chef really worked very hard in to benefit the growers and, and the, the, the importance of the product to be able to get those wonderful recipes. And, Mm. Yes, we need the, 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 we, the cook doesn't just uh, do this wonderful show cooking and what they're doing and how the feelings uh, of, of the people who are eating it, what history there is, what's the story behind that product, how do you think from this sector we can not only obviously work to reach a green with those cooking stars, how can how can we um, help storytelling? Over the years, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the product has been becoming much much more important in different kitchens. I think it's a need that to the consumer is transmitting this tomato. I mean, where's it from? What type of tomato? Is it? It's a need. Then there are more and more producers. There are more food journalists. There are many people talking about this topic. The, the consumers themselves are asking for this this story in the product. And talking about uh, high cuisine, uh, they're discovering it on on a smaller scale. Question of time, consumers will appreciate more and more this story behind the product. In our gastronomy, there are products. We have to really respect all the characteristics, uh, all the uh, organoleptic characteristics and features behind it. Talking about uh, virgin olive oil, it can be a wonderful experience, gastronomic experience in itself. So this communication between different disciplines, different sectors, between the growers and the chefs can be shared, opinions that can be shared, chats. It's the labor that, that Lola, you're doing with diffusion of agriculture is really important. And the new generations of chefs yeah, I'm much more aware now of the importance of knowing the roots of the product. That's the the situation. Thank you. In here, Virginia. Mine is short. After Tomato Sapiens, are you going to carry on with uh, aubergines, another type of uh, product? An idea? No, for the moment we're with the Tomato Sapiens. Uh, other products. It's uh, the first um, story in Wikipedia about a, a not uh, produced. Okay. Big round of applause to Mira. Much indeed. And Mira was talking before about trying to imitate tuna with tomato, and I'm beginning to remember now. I was with a chef yesterday in La Costa restaurant who does it with uh, sweet red peppers and he, he achieves wonderful effects, the possibilities of fruit and vegetable from these solar greenhouses. Now this tomato, I feel like it's <laughs> to be or not to be, that's the tomato. Now we're going to see another.
got uh, cookies from uh, aubergines. Buenas, hoy vamos a presentar nuestro de berenjena, que es una del clásico Now we're going to introduce our uh, hot aubergine, uh, sort of like a, a hot dog, but instead of using a, a, a sausage, we're going to use that texture with an aubergine. We're going to let them to, to get really well cooked here, and while they're goldening off, Browning off, um, butter, pepper, uh, breadcrumbs, which are added herbs to. You can put uh, capers in, eggs, tomatoes. We're going to eat tomatoes because they're very sweet and sauce like that. They're very, very tasty. As the peppers are cooking, it takes a while for them. We're going to do the tomato sauce, the cherry tomatoes, we cut them directly and we put them in the pot. We can cut them in, in half. Very important to use sawtooth knives for tomatoes so you don't have to sharpen it every Okay, we'll just squash them a little bit later with a fork. And the idea of this tomato sauce is to uh, emulate the curry worst, which is ketchup with curry. So we're going to add a little bit of curry to it in the end. The cherry tomatoes are turning into a puree almost on their own, as you can see here. Very nice sauce there. In the meantime, we carry on with our... Uh, Aubergine, which is carrying on being cooked inside. We're going to open up hot dog bread. <clears throat> we made it ourselves, but you can make it in any place. We're going to make it very easily. Um, a little slice down the middle, and we open it up. And that's where we're going to put everything the aubergine is going to have. So the sauce is ready. It's important, as always, to taste it. <coughs> and to put a bit of salt and pepper, depending on uh, your taste. We can use a fork to squash them down a little bit. Now we're going to take them out in a bowl and we're going to add them hot. <coughs> um, as always, with all the different types of um, spices, taste. So as we want it to look very similar to the currywurst in Berlin, we put quite a lot in. So it reminds us taste. We open one of the, the aubergines. Okay, I think the tech, both of them are ready. Very careful not to burn yourselves. Okay, we open it up and down the middle, take the take the head off. and we cut it into four. So for breading it we do it just with egg. <coughs> and breadcrumbs I mentioned before. I'm going to put a little bit of dry pepper on it <coughs> and let's put them in the in the egg here here we've got the sauce here what we're going to do is open up our, our hot dog and put a good layer of sauce in there now we're going to bread the aubergine we're going to add some some butter which we're going to carry on it needs quite a lot. The, got it on the on the hot plate. Uh, the ideal thing would be for it to be a little hot. So we're going to carry on adding butter to it, and as it's diluting, we're going to start uh, putting it on top. When it when the bread is nice. Golden. We're going to take it straight into the bread. 
We include it. And include the cheese. And then we're going to send it back to the to the frying pan to absorb all the butter. Cheese is melting. We can get our hot hot. As you notice, cutting it, it's still uh, quite uh, quite. Hot. Okay, we see it's m the bread is much more juicier and healthier. Now the time has come to taste it. If you want, you can put a little bit of basil into the uh, sauce or the. Hmm, uh, just. Uh, we did some tests with uh, meat and we preferred this one because it's much tastier. Yeah, to eat an aubergine. <coughs> Chef, it's really, really tasty. I've also tasted them. It's speck. And turning, talking about Berlin, well, they they eat lots and lots of fruit and vegetables in Berlin and the whole of Germany. Now we're going to carry on with the next speaker. The next speaker, Life in Fantastic, uh, from Deborah Garcia, as a chemist and a science communicator, a lecturer on the master's degree in scientific culture at the University, of the Basque Country in the Public University of Navarre. She's getting in the advanced. Uh, studies of uh, our Coruña. She's um, a scientific uh, communicator. She works on television. You've seen her in or again the Sixth Channel, Galician Television, Radio Galega. She's going to talk about uh, the, the containers that accompany fruit and vegetables. Those before, those and after. Deborah got here. Please, David, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you one of those questions for you not to think too much and answer quickly. What do you think when you think about the future? I can read your minds two things. One, some of you think about climate some of you global warming, the next pandemic, which will be probably from a very resistant bacteria. So you will be the apoc apocalyptic. There are others who are thinking we'll have a vaccine for Alzheimer, another one for AIDS. We'll also have cheap, cleaner energy. We'll have that what we're talking about now, the circular economy, and everything will go much better. We are the optimists, but even optimistic, we're not, we're not ambitious. My parents, when I was 20, what do you think about the future? Oh, flying clouds, uh, we'll end up losing on Mars, we'll cure all the illness, and we will have uh, in a machine we're even very ambi li little ambitious for that. I'm talking about the pandemic now, I see it even more, these expressions, this is us. You heard it, right? We deserve, in we deserve extinction. That. We have to reflect on that sort of thing. Because <coughs> really, there's a bit of self-hate there. There's everything that belongs to us as humans uh, is wrong, and we punishment because of it. And it happens with almost everything which is contemporary. Because contemporary, how do we do things now? And valuing s ra romantically, how do we do it in the past? Oh, in the in the good old days, we did things much better. It happens nowadays. Art, contemporary art. Oh, that's not as good as as the art before. It happens with everything. It happens with materials. For the first time in history, the material time is completely demonized. The material of our time is this, plastic, and we're demonizing it. We demonize everything that's contemporary. And of course, we have a problem. We're, oceans are gaining the
the, the battle over reason. How can you debate with somebody who says plastic is bad, full stop? Plastic is bad for everything. How, these dichotomies are not in, don't exist or bad. There are many subtleties. How do you how you use it? Plastic is not a material. A very wide family of materials. Polymers. Uh, we don't call them plastics. It's very difficult to face all of that. There's a lot of m m misinformation. There's a drip of misinformation regarding plastic is not informing. They only talk about plastics when there's something negative to say about them. We don't talk about the positive factors. And we've got another added problem, which is the big problem of the lack of scientific culture. More than half the population does not understand a uh, article. So how look at this lack of misinformation and the, the lack of in understanding? Of the, the scientific topics, we have to talk about the good, the goodness of plastic. We have to inform about that. It's a symbol of progress, the, the same as all the other materials of their uh, period. There's been enormous progress, thanks to we've got pros pieces, syringes, masks that you're carrying. They're made of. If they're uh, uh, officially accepted, they're polymers that have been pressed. We can so that not even the aerosols in which virus and bacteria travel, those polymers have an inertia that, that avoid them getting through. Lives would have been saved thanks to that. Plastic is present in the isolation of our dwellings, uh, acoustic, uh, and same with cars. Security systems are made of plastic. We've lightened vehicles thanks to plastics. We think that transport, transport is the main emitter of transport lighter, which we do thanks to plastics. You are reducing the emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere, which is the main uh, culprit of climate change, anti fire systems, many things that we are using that are made of plastic, food, how do we make plastic, uh, we can uh, pr create a, a protected atmosphere and serve, keep that food in there. So this is one of the great problems that we have, and, and it's solved by plastics. <coughs> we make uh, all the food that we consume much safer. We don't have any uh, the content to the food. It's inert. We've got plastic today above our heads. These greenhouses feed the whole world, and thanks to the fact that they have plastic, we can control the radiation to our plants. We can keep the infrared uh, radiation here. We can produce that, reducing the water footprint using a lot less water. A greenhouse is the most sustainable way to produce uh, food. This has to be said. All the benefits of plastic have to be told. Otherwise, we will find that we're in a debate between reason is science, facts, arguments, and on the other side, the debate, if you can't win that, how do you win it? Through emotions. Emotions are the quality of being irrefutable and winning the battle. And we have to take things with facts. The rejection to plastic is an emotional rejection. It's not a scientific rejection, it's emotional. And this competes with how we romanticize uh, uh, materials, glass, cardboard. There's a completely different, much more romantic perspective with these materials. So they, this is what we have to talk about. The problem is that although scientists know this, 
there are standards, regulations which go against scientific consensus, which are assimilated the general public. Yeah, they're going against the prejudices, they're going, going with the prejudices, and they're even celebrated. For example, when the standard for uh, one one way use plastic was celebrated uh, cardboard straws you eliminate plastic one one way plastic you've got another material which is going to be is being used for the same thing the problem is not the material the problem is the one time whatever it is all of them have an environmental footprint um, uh, carbon has a much higher um, environmental footprint and scientists who measure this <coughs> we do life uh, life length analysis so the impact of all 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 of okay where I left the straw on the hillside who cares it's biodegradable and, and a plastic biodegrade we can't just stay with that. We have to analyze everything. Where does the material come from? What environmental impact does that have? How is it transformed? How many times can it be used? Is it recyclable? Recycle it. All this gives us this uh, material. To make cardboard, we have to cut down trees. Okay. Production process. The life cycle of cardboard is three, three times plastic a plastic a straw it's horrible that we have cardboard uh, any of them because they go soft and they're disgusting apart from a, being a disgusting thing they're not even recyclable any cardboard that has been come into contact with food and is impregnated cannot be recycled so the problem is possibly why do we need a straw unless we have some sort of health problem or something like that why do we need a straw well this is happening with everything for example with cutlery you can't find plastic cutlery they're all cardboard or wood and so you see these salads from the supermarket that are beautifully prepared and now they're saying uh, it comes with a wooden spoon a compost, compostable sport bamboo fork how is a, a bamboo fork going to be sustainable that you're going to use once and throw away and then we have to talk about food, food safety using wood in uh, food you have to put out of food preparation those of you in spatulas in your house those spatulas to damn they've got they've got uh, oh, let's leave it to dry for a week that means you've got a biofilm on your spoon you've got a colony of bacteria on your spoon <laughs> they've designed a indestructible fortress and you cannot get rid of them so throw away your your uh, mucky spatulas what i see you sell that at, uh, fork and you ask, where are those salads consumed? In the offices, in the house, where you probably have a metal fork, which is really a pleasure to eat with. Why does it have to have a fork? The problem isn't the material. The problem is you don't need it. Why don't we send the, the box in a supermarket? Because you're going to take it in a park. Charge you some sense as when they charge you the same way the, the bag. The problem is not the material. The problem is the one u one way use Men celebrated and then you look at reality and then you see all the problems there are because we're changing one material for another for the appearance for the beliefs that we think people have about materials now for example the european union has proposed from now to 2025 we use much more recycled plastic in packaging and absolutely assume the idea the recycled plastic is uh, reincorporated 10 million tons of plastic uh, reincorporated we're talking about uh, last year 62 million tons 
Solutions. It's a very ambitious uh, challenge. What about recycled plastic? We only recycle half the plastic, only half of it. So there are different ways to recycle plastic. The, the recycling, conventional recycling, mechanical recycling, if you put uh, heat into them, they, they melt. You can melt them, give it a new shape, new shape for new use for the plastic. You can separate they're melted, they're called thermoplastics. You separate them, give them a new shape, and you're recycling. That's the way we have uh, recycling polythene in supermarket bags, polypropylene, bottles of uh, detergent, or PET, the water bottles. PET is one of the plastics that is uh, most easily recyclable. A lot of technology, a lot of industry, uh, and many. Now, if you notice, the drinks uh, industry, they incorporate recycled PET. It can be recycled again and again, almost infinitely. So that reduces its uh, environmental footprint. Uh, it doesn't weigh very much. It's resistant, so you can you can use it well. Because recycled plastics can be used in contact. There are, you can't just put uh, anything in contact. So you have to carry out a lot of uh, tests and that uh, standard of guarantee uh, that you can use even with water, for example. There are other ways. And uh, thirty percent of the plastics are recycled. You can you can shred it, melt it, and there's another uh, way to recycle is chemical recycling, which eighty percent of the plastics can be recycled. There are plastics which can be melted. these are thermostable. Uh, they either turn into liquids or they burn, so we need other methods. Epoxy resin, polyurethane, polystyrene, those fish boxes. We can recycle them with a method called chemical recycling. Plastic, we call polymer. Imagine it's a, a collar of balls. Each of those balls is a monomer. When you heat that polymer, you twist it, you shame. But when you do chemical recycling, you cut the balls apart and you separate the monomers, and then you can reconstruct them, um, producing different plastics. And that can be done over and over again. There are many techniques. There's one called pyrolysis. <coughs> pyrolysis is heating it to a very high temperature. Where you break those links between the monomers. And uh, pyrolysis oils to make uh, fuel. There are other technicians. It's a dissolvent which dissolves these uh, links between the monomers. Enzymatic, enzymatic degradation which only destroys the, the links between the monomers. The idea is to balls, the separate balls, and recompose them. So we have plastics which are identi identical to a virgin plastic, uh, an original plastic. It's a recycling system which has many, many possibilities. We can obtain plastics which could be in contact because it has contact with as the same qualities as virgin problem. It's not contemplated as recycled, recycled plastic. So if it's recycled, it's not recycled. So it's not. So you have to pay the same tax. This is the virgin plastic. It's not adapted to the standards. There's no fiscal benefit. So it seems that science is far, far ahead of the legislation. And that's the problem we have with recycled plastic. And now we have a new standard uh, coming about uh, food packaging. When I was studying the Royal Decree, all of it was more or less okay. So we clarity, reducing residues, until you get to the sentence where it says the use of packaging, plastic packaging, will be forbidden for uh, 
and vegetables for less than a and a half. Apart from strawberries and blueberries, you can carry on using them. You have to stop using plastic, plastic packaging, not packaging, plastic packaging. So you think, ah, you start thinking, cardboard straw. And this is what we're seeing. What we're seeing in the supermarkets, we're beginning, we're preparing ourselves for this new standard um, food in cardboard. For example, food yeah, in, in the nets and for nut oranges and potatoes made of cotton. How can you realize, how can you think that cotton is more sustainable than plastic? Look at the life cycle of cotton. You have, the, have to have the intensive plantations of cotton. It's got an enormous use, water use. They're one of the most dependent on water. For one kilo of cotton, 40,000 liters of water. It isn't recyclable. It isn't recycled. Or if it is, much less than plastic. How can we think that it's a good idea to change a plastic net for a cotton net? But, ah, but the standard says we have to eliminate plastic. Not the packaging, plastic. So, yeah. When uh, we uh, encourage bulk uh, buying, so okay, let's go for a, a sustainable, recyclable plastic. Uh, support that industry. Otherwise, you're going to have cardboard boxes, um, cotton net bags, and cotton materials. Uh, it's a mix of uh, materials. It isn't possible to recycle technologically viable but extremely expensive tetra bricks of water plastic in contact with the water cardboard aluminium cardboard again the the, the dyes the plastic who's going to recycle that you can't separate them or well, in theory you can't recycle you can't separate it give me recycle I can recycle it over and over again. Ah, but it's brown and it's got cardboard. It looks like something really sustainable. Taking decisions, absurd decisions, because these standards are not adapted to reality. The technology that we have, the one that we know, the scientific knowledge that we have, and in the end, we are regulating according to emotions. What do we think the people are going to think is better? And that's what he makes me angry. That's why we research so much and so much research into different materials, how they impact the environment. Materials. So I think it's something that really have to slow down. They're taking decisions that are very important with a great impact, which are not based. What we're doing is taking decisions from a very. This is why I considered uh, the, uh, the the song "Life in Plastic" is fantastic. You know that one? <laughs> that song, in the end, is ridiculing that frivolous, superficial life, and we're immersed in that sort of situation. So we're not constantly uh, meeting stump scientists. Uh, the the te technology can really help us face the problem of climate change. Plastic, no. Uh, artificial intelligence. How on earth do you expect the scientists to combat climate change with with? Deborah, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to listen to you in this solar greenhouse. Now it's question time. Enrique de los Rios. Uh, for the people who are following us on streaming to, to listen. Congratulations, presentation, and the way you have of explaining things being right, but it's being able to move people with reason. Here we're in a greenhouse, a plastic greenhouse. We have the science behind us. We've got a crop, 
an intensive crop, healthy product, which is feeding Europe. We, we've got everything on our side, but we're not able to fight. Neither the scientists nor the producers are able to change the mindset of the people, and the politicians aren't helping much. The people as voters, and if they think like some, they think a certain thing. Okay, let's do what they think that we should be doing. Please, this situation. What is the most sensible thing to do? What what sort of a root card should we? following how, how where will we start talking about it talk about it as a scientist i feel that in science consider that ah, in the end reason will have a way and it's not true and these things happen all of a sudden you see a royal decree it's completely absurd contrary to if we want to combat climate change and how can we possibly regulate like that? That we are, we're getting there just in time or just after time. Fighting against the lack of uh, logic is. You have to f face emotional reactions of many people. So not all the scientists are able to, to or to do that because it has a cost. We have to be braver <coughs> and speak about things clearly and show things, show what you do here and how it's done and tell people, <coughs> look for the gap. When I'm, you know, I'm moving around, wiggle, wiggle room. Okay, get into uh, people who've got uh, the news, who's got impact. Okay, it's the same person who's talking about the prejudice. Maybe go against the grain. Yeah, maybe a few stones. Yeah. If I if I use cardboard, yeah, it's reality. We have to be brave and and talk about it and tell it, tell the story. <coughs> Connecting there um, to the question of Enrique, it's not usual to find a colleague colleagues of yours talking well about plastic. Is there some censorship amongst your colleagues? Because there is a cost in subjects, and I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about because I'm going to have problems with that. There's so much misinformation, or so little information, or the cultural level is so low that I'm going to get stoned every time I mention this. Every time I talk about uh, and plastic, I'm going to really Digitally, uh, is going to be up in arms. So I'm not saying anything new. There are many professionals like me also very clear about it. It does have a cost, and you have to know how to value it. Everybody values it in their own way. For me, it's worth it. Thank you for your transparency, your clarity. Um, the the ideal polymer of the food industry. What would it be? Uh, uh, pet were, were to be subsidized. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the pet is uh, is approved. If you have to package something, it would be one of the ideal polymers. <coughs> there has to be more investment. One of the other polymers, polypropylene, which is the Tupperware, you can put it in uh, microwaves, you can heat it up, you can use it many times. If you buy humus or something which comes in a polypropylene Tupperware, you can you can wash it and I can wash it and I keep it as a as a Tupperware. So there are very option there are various options, not just one. And so what's in contact with if you want to give it more lives, if you want to fav favor a recycling chain, if I think section of a supermarket will be easier to concentrate on one type of uh, material which we have structure for it um, collect system to collect it has to be a pure polymer otherwise you're going to have problems another thing is to concentrate on design if it's eco it's design otherwise it's not and you can also separate 
um, containers apart. Maybe you need a polymer and aluminium cover. So you can, okay, you need to be able to separate the materials. Okay, it can be recycled. It's not in contact with, with, uh, with the really separate and like a tetra brick that, uh, that can't be separated. Uh, there are more ingenious ways, different materials. And what industrial support do we have for recycling and with the design? Another question, Jose Antonio, you're very inspiring. We're in the, the, the sea of plastic. It seems like a taboo area, an area called the sea of plastic. You know, bad to say it. Maybe we're the first legion fighting for plastic. I wanted to, to mention that to you. Yeah, I feel very, very sad because people speak badly about it. This morning we were explained all of that. In the, then it changes your idea. Well, you don't have to convince me too much. I understand somebody who, who's been misinformed coming in here. What is this? And then all of a sudden you see this. You see greenery. This is creating the oxygen that we breathe. These have to be shown. Uh, plastic is transparent and must be shown. Jose Antonio. Congratulations, Deborah, for your talk. It's been, I think I speak for everybody, it's really inspiring as I Antonio said, my question is connected with the duality that you have in your work. Yeah, there are many journalists here. We're specialists in agriculture and we're on growers and technicians and micro. You have the duality of being able to be on national television and to be with the general public who knows nothing about agriculture. And you're, you've been in here uh, in cute sort of water footprint, biological control, the albedo effect, the CO2 control. If it depended on you to give that knowledge or spread that knowledge, what of the uh, um, reasons of solar greenhouses would we have to start with to inspire people? What, what would I start with? There are many positive things, many pros. Now we're talking about climate change. <coughs> Most of the population associates it directly with CO2. This is a sump for CO2. It's, and we're receiving more oxygen thanks to this. It's something for us. It's very obvious, but not everybody connects. We don't use that much water because we've got this on, to, on top of us. There are many, many things. So we've got a problem with hunger. How are we going to feed people? we can get food in a completely sustainable way and in an unsustainable way. So we can produce more than ever thanks to There are many fronts. The typical obvious things are when you talk, of course, yeah, never thought about that. And when I publish things, uh, some on my, my and, oh goodness me, never thought that a greenhouse could be sustainable. It's so basic, so fundamental. Sometimes pills of information that, uh, that I do it on all the media. Uh, <laughs> so you concentrate on one and talk about plastics. That's it. One day I'm going to publish something in my social networks, on my radio program, and I'm going to dedicate it to how can this be sustainable. And I will explain it. Adapt to your audience, to your environment. It's not the same on the radio to explain people who already know. And it's not the same to explain it to other audiences. <laughs> yeah, I can be so fortunate because I get a, I have a voice in, in many places. There are many programs. I like is a science program but to be in magazines, on a magazine in the afternoon, in the morning, talk about varieties, you start talking about plastic or whatever. So it's, it's expected knowledge and yeah, the different, 
different case and the knowledge and the capacity to communicate it to everybody. One more question uh, from Lola, and then we're going to have to. I think that there are many routes to to attempt the society to understand us, the sustainability of plastic. In Mar Marconi, in the, there are about 300 people in BASF uh, factory there. And there are two talks, one in the morning, those people who work making plastics, and thanks to them we have all this photo selectivity, etc., don't know the end user. They don't know who they're working for. They have no idea. I really enjoyed. Yeah, I, I took containers, um, drip irrigation. I took absolutely everything. And they're surprised with the lack of knowledge that that people at the top of the company was extremely lucky to to pay a visit to them, and they considered it was it necessary. It's to say, you said the problem. The lack of information or misinformation is we're coming face to face with emotions. Let's do things. Good, uh, entrepreneurs, let's take advantage of the emotions. Let's learn how to connect that science to communicate it. We have to see the environment that we're moving. Not communicating it technically, emotionally, evangelize. So people, when they hear it, are believers, believers uh, in the sector of the, the sea of plastic of Almeria, to learn how to communicate that. It will be a, a, a way to go forward to attempt to reach those people and thousands and millions of people working in the world of plastic. One of the users, some of the users of those plastics, uh, and thanks to that, we achieve do you think that would be the way forward? I think what difficult is to know uh, to know every topic so deeply. If we talk about people talking about material science and research, I need <coughs> this radiation through a uh, uh, specialist in. Uh, chemicals will be able to to do that. So we need it, it, it needs to be. We don't we don't know how to put the additives, the polymers in. And in the end, the objective is to combine forms of knowledge. It's very difficult to not meet every, people who know everything about something. I have a lot to learn about that. I can talk about the material because I'm a chemist, but I'm not a grower. And that's why I have to talk to people who know more than me. And yeah, it's not one person who does it well. It's connecting people. That's the idea. Everybody's doing a good job there. Interaction. Interaction is the key. What you said to use that for things in our favor, I try. So I consider I do it rigorously with data, with facts and scientific evidence. To use emotion and doesn't mean that emotion is just used to trick. So if you want to trick, you have to use emotion. If you're going to tell the truth, you can you can do everything well. You can tell the truth and move people as well. Well, thank you very much indeed, Deborah, for accompanying us once again. Thank you for being here in Ingo Solar. Please uh, take a seat. Okay, we're going to see one more video, and we're going to explain this method of production, and we're going to finish the party, and we're going to the solar greenhouse bring the greenhouse efficient, innovative, and sustainable agricultural model.
capable of feeding 500 million Europeans a year, but they also look after our planet. More than 90% of our farmers comply with the most demanding certification systems and good agricultural practice standards, and they're advised by agricultural experts farming, waste management and recycling. 95% of the plastic we generate and recycle, 80% of it. We're at the forefront of national recycling, with more than 100,000 tons of plastic recycled per year. This represents 10% of the total recycled plastic in our country, and is equivalent to more than 1.5 billion plastic bottles. This is how it works. Plastic roofs represent the largest volume of plastic waste generated, and recycling where they're turned into pallets and given a second life in the form of urban furniture, new containers and liquid. If you want to find out more, follow the sun. We're from Europe. We're sustainable. In the southeast of Spain, mainly in the province and Granada. For two days, uh, very important points, uh, very interesting points regarding our solar greenhouses. The agriculture out here, and all the questions, uh, all issues related with innovation, the advances that are being carried out here. And we do this for producers, the growers, and also for the consumers. So. They are well informed, as somebody said here just a moment ago. We have to ask them to let the communication and knowledge flow. All this work is part of a program, a European program, a promotion and information called Cute Solar, creating the taste of Europe in the greenhouses. And in front of that program is, of course, the open collaboration of the European Commission, but also a made up of APROA, Orte España, and three organizations that defend and work for the producers and agriculture based on good practices, good agricultural practices. It's time for us to say goodbye. We'll be back next year. And uh, this is all on the, on the net in Cute Solar, in Ver Solar, so you'll be able to continue enjoying the chats and them in the future. I'm going to ask all the speakers, Jesus, Deborah, Noen, and Mireya, and of course the president of Orte with us now. Uh, let's do a family photo. Thank you very much to all of you. See you next time round, and enjoy the weekend. Eva and Bruno. Eva and Bruno like to help their parents shop and discover new flavors. Where does fruit and vegetables come from? How are they produced when it's so cold out? To find out, we must travel to Southeast Europe in a region that has turned into a vegetable garden, capable of providing healthy food to five Europeans for nine months of the year, even during winter. But how is it possible that a semi-arid region has become the main supplier of winter fruit and vegetables in Europe? By strengthening the traditional agricultural techniques of the area with technology and continuously incorporating innovation to improve the productivity, quality and sustainability of crops, such as the use of sanding, plastic greenhouse coverings, drip irrigation, quantities of seed to the conditions of the area and organic pest control that make it possible to produce millions of fruit and vegetables per year. A key part of this agricultural revolution is the greenhouse. But what is a solar greenhouse? It's a structure with a translucent cover which captures all the sun's energy while protecting crops from adverse environmental conditions, generating greater productivity with minimal cost and resource consumption. 
by creating microclimates, we can grow our fruits and vegetables at any time of the year. In a sustainable way, without resorting to fossil fuels, obtaining a greater quantity of food without sacrificing quality or taste. The miracle of intensive agriculture in this area of Europe is founded on small and family-owned farms, favoring entrepreneurship, share capital, equality and to protecting natural resources and the environment. The development of partner or cooperative companies is encouraged, as well as the education of workers, 80% of which have some type of special training. Despite the common perception of this part of Europe being a sea of plastic, in reality, the surface area of greenhouses occupy about 30,000 hectares, 3.4% of the total area of land, while almost 50% of this geographical area is protected, which is well above the European average. Techniques such as rainwater harvesting, precision drip irrigation systems or fertigation result in a water that is 20 times lower than in crops that are cultivated the open air. Additionally, greenhouses have contributed to the reduction of the average annual temperature in the area, and each hectare absorbs 10 tons of CO2, which is equivalent to the daily emission of eight cars. Marketing is carried out by means of cooperatives or agricultural transformation companies, improving the farmer's position within the supply chain and their access to funding and technology. The region is a leader in recruiting foreigners into the Spanish workforce, integrating more than 140 nationalities, with agricultural wages that are up to 90% higher than other non-EU countries. Women 